some loud, I don't need, need, need augmentation, but hopefully it's all good. Um, and thank you very much for uh, supporting this series. So, um, so what I'm going to be doing, not talking really much about grass today, I'm going to be focusing on neural systems that I think put people at increased risk for antisocial behavior and looking at uh, providing a few early strands of data from this first year, um, um, focusing around how maltreatment and substance abuse uh, disrupt the development of some of these systems. So that's what the flavor is going to be. I will just get through. Uh, so. Uh, now we come on to the next slide. Ah, there we go. Good. Oh. Ah. Did you just turn off the uh, wireless? Here we go. So, what I'm going to do um, is very briefly tell you a little bit about Boys Town because you may or may not be familiar with Boys Town. Um, it's a good chance you're not at all familiar with Boys Town, so I will tell you a little bit about Boys Town, particularly since many of you will be thinking this guy was at NIMH and then he moved to Omaha. What went wrong with his life? I mean, uh, and any of you who come from Omaha, I apologize profusely. I quite like living in Omaha, so it's not meant to be a disparaging thing about Omaha. But for those who don't, you'll be probably thinking disparaging things about Omaha, so I'm just going to tell you why. Um, and then I'm going to get into the, um, the uh, main substance of what we're doing about these systems and talking uh, uh, again a little bit about some of the, um, at least these sort of social or environmental um, uh, impacts that um, disrupt the development. Ooh, what there? This might be quite exciting. So, Boys Town, what is Boys Town? Boys Town is a large residential treatment centre um, uh, on the western edge of uh, Omaha. Um, it housed about 400 kids in, residential in the residential treatment center who stay for around a year, a year and a half uh, there and then move back or move on to um, uh, um, uh, other locations. Um, it's, a, it's about 400 kids a year. We work with about 200 of those kids so far each year uh, because the other 200 are wards of state. We can't actually work with wards of state, so we're working with parents um, uh, who agree to let their kids take part. It's, um, uh, although it's called Boys Town, it's 40% uh, girls there. So um, uh, they, they flirted for a, little while, a short while of calling it Boys and Girls Town, but apparently the Boys and Girls Club didn't like this very much, so they went back to Boys Town. <laughs> and um, um, if you actually see the logo, oops, this, oh dear, oops. Well, you would see the logo if I had. Uh, I wish I had gone backwards. Hopefully, that won't happen again. I'm not going to go backwards to show the logo, but the logo now actually has. A, um, uh, it used to be um, a one boy carrying another boy because he was carrying the, the boy that was uh, through the snow. Now it's one boy carrying a girl. So yeah. uh, to show the, um, uh, the, um, the fact that it is a um, boys and girls there. Um, uh, there's also a large number of Boys Town centers around the US. So it means that um, any results that we have that are useful, we can effectively port them across the country, which is really one of the major reasons why I want to come here. The, the idea is, is that we've moved. I mean, NIH, I was, it was a fantastically well-resourced institution, as you can imagine. The big problem is actually recruiting participants at NIH. I was averaging around 15 to 20 new participants a year, which is great from basic science studies. You can still do quite a lot with 15 to 20 people a year, um, um, particularly if you're doing lots of, lots of multiple studies, and particularly if you're focusing on patient groups as well. But 15 to 20 group patients a year is never going to give you anything that's going to be clinically useful. Now we're working with 100 cases a year um, or more. So you're suddenly in a situation where we can collect large enough data sets that actually can provide information that actually might be relevant to a clinician. So that's a principal reason for doing it. Basically, um, uh, the um, uh, Boys Town itself, the hospital, and the donor community around in Omaha um, set aside a fair amount of money to set up this new Center for Neuro Behavioral Research, which I took over a year ago to really translate what we were doing at NIH into, or at least to see whether we could translate what we were doing into, into NIH into something that actually might be practically useful to um, clinicians working in. So I didn't think. 
No, it comes back. Sometimes it comes back, sometimes it goes away. So, now this is the sample of participants we collected in March this year. So that was starting off um, probably September of, uh, of 2000, um, well no, actually, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, September of 2016 um, um, to March. Um, it just gives you an idea of the flavor of the, the participant um, group. So around about 50%, 40% of the youth there have ADHD, um, high levels of ODD, CD, also reasonable levels of MDD, GAD, generalized anxiety disorder, social anxiety disorder, and PTSD. So there's a fair degree of clinical heterogeneity in the population. There's no bipolar disorder, there's no autism, there's no schizophrenia. We don't do anything to do with those disorders at all. It's these internalizing and externalizing conditions because those are the conditions um, that the, in, the majority of the kids in Boys Town face. And of course this was, all of those numbers have at least doubled, if not gone up um, uh, more than that since um, March. So here's where we are as regards um, um, psychiatric diagnosis. We're in this horrific situation that you go to a clinician and you talk to the clinician, uh, and the child may talk to the clinician about what they're doing, what behaviours they're showing, how they're feeling. It's purely verbal based. The clinician talks to you as the parent, the clinician talks to the child. Um, there are no objective measures about anything that's wrong with the individual. I mean, I think one of the things you came to say earlier on this year, I went with my three year old who um, had a horrible cough. And um, you know they did indeed. The clinician did ask me about the horrible cough. They did, uh, not that my three-year-old was saying anything terribly useful, but still they sort of tried to get something terribly useful out of her about how she was feeling. But then you got measures to see what the oxygen level. You got um, uh, people actually seeing what the um, you know what the sound of the lungs are. You got you got an X-ray to see whether there was evidence of problems in the lungs. And indeed she had pneumonia, so it was a significant problem. We could see the pneumonia was there. We could see that um, the pneumonia was treated by antibiotics and we can see that the um, treatment response was successful. We cannot do that in psychiatry or, you know, it's the, the one sort of terrible, you know, uh, awkward medical field where we just do not have those sorts of measures. We don't know what really an individual has at the brain level. We don't know whether the intervention has worked because we can't see biological um, uh, level details on whether there's been amelioration of the problems. Yes, the person may say they feel better, and that sometimes is not such a bad measure. But when you're suddenly dealing with conduct disorder, where there's a good incentive that the person will say, yeah, I feel better now, I do not have conduct disorder, you let me go now, please, that's not where we really want to be. Substance abuse, massive problems with substance abuse as well. I mean, we measure substance abuse on whether the interventions worked, whether the person is not taking drugs right now. That's not too bad, but the fact is we really want to know whether we're not going to be taking drugs again in six months later. We want to know whether the risk factors have gone away. And so this for me is, um, 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 you know, how do we know what a person has? How do we know what the intervention has been, whether the intervention has been successful? Those are the sort of things that at least um, are where I would know, really like to see whether we can make a difference. Then we have this real problem in all of these sort of problem spaces and the fact that all of these things are so massively comorbid. I mean, trauma is linked to problems in acute threat, from these, these neural level problems, uh, increased the risk of aggression, conduct problems, substance abuse. Substance abuse is related to all these things. Depression I could have stuck in this here as well. Um, anxiety disorders I can have stuck in. It's no accident that all of those comorbid conditions that I showed you in the Boys Town population are there, because all of those comorbid conditions are massively comorbid with one another. I mean, it's these massive problems in psychiatric populations where people come in with multiple diagnoses. Um, and again, it's the question of whether they're coming with multiple diagnoses because it's multiple level systems that have got down, or whether it's just because, indeed, we're based around these not very successful ways of assessing an individual. Magical trick backwards and forwards, sooner or later the slides come back. So, what are we trying to do? So, what am I trying to do now is to really identify um, neural signatures of healthy development um, using uh, both the sort of standard known techniques as well as the machine learning techniques that are now becoming so um, uh, prevalent. The reason why I'm interested in indexing healthy development 
within the 10 to 18 age range, this is the population we work with, is because I want to see the extent to which any individual child coming into Boys Town diverges from what we can see is the, the shape of a 14-year-old male brain with this level of IQ, or a 17-year-old female brain with this level of IQ, the extent to which they diverge from that um, level of problem to see whether that relates to symptom set severity. But in addition to that, we're also looking for neural signatures that relate directly to issues like substance abuse, to uh, maltreatment, and particularly different forms of maltreatment, and also, of course, neural signatures related to particular forms of psychopathology. Is the individual with, um, say, irritability, do they show just some divergence from the healthy pattern, or do they, on top of showing a divergence from the healthy pattern, show something completely different from the healthy pattern? Is it they're not doing the healthy thing, or is it they're doing something completely different on top of, or instead of, not doing the healthy thing? And I think you can start to see, at least I hope with some of the data we're going to show, some of the indications of both of these sorts of things. Um, uh, and then, of course, what I really, you know, the whole point about doing these sort of getting these signals is we want to know whether current available treatments actually do anything. Do we see an individual who is supposedly being treated, does it pull them back into the healthy range, or does it remove their atypical signature, or does it do both? So that's the sort of question that we're asking. Obviously, the uh, Boys Town employed us because they're hoping that we can examine the extent to which the Boys Town intervention does that. But at the same time, we are looking at uh, we're looking at some pharmacology, some pharmacological interventions, and other forms of psychosocial interventions to really get a picture of um, uh, you know whether we see some degree of selective effects. I'm going to show at the very end a very flashed up bit of data, but that's all I'm going to really be doing about that. And so, we, which brain level problems of voice town intervention or other interventions work with uh, work best for? So, that is really why I'm doing this. That's why I've moved to voice town. It's the chance for me to be able to translate the basic stuff I was doing into NMH into something that might actually be practically useful, or to find out that sadly everything I've been doing up to now is totally useless and can't help anybody, which is my nightmare. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm, I'm hoping that in the, my worst case scenario, is that at least at group level, I can say this intervention does pull at a group level this type of pathology back into a healthy uh, direction. I obviously want to be able to be doing it at the individual level. I would like you know, to be in a situation where any child coming in who's having a change in treatment program, we evaluate them before the treatment program, and then we see whether the treatment program has normalized the individual's difficulties. But um, I don't know whether we'll get to that stage. That's my dream of uh, deliciousness. But, um, but uh, at the very worst case scenario, I think at least the group that we can evaluate, does um, intervention X work, does intervention Y work, does the Boys Town program, what does the Boys Town program work for? That's the worst case scenario. But I really hope that we're better than that. So what I'm going to do now is flash up some of these particular systems, neurocognitive systems, that I think are um, directly re relate to different forms of antisocial behavior. They don't just relate necessarily, and I'll try and flat, 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 um, um, uh, show some of the broader patterns, but it's going to be focused on antisocial behavior. So, we're going to be talking about four systems, one to do with empathy, one to do with acute threat responding, one to do with response control, and one to do with reinforcement-based decision making. And I'm going to show you some schematics, and they really get pretty schematics, uh, neural circuitry and um, uh, other beautiful framework approaches, um, uh, which are grossly inadequate, but at least begin to show you the sort of mappings that we're attempting at the moment, the preliminary mappings. So empathy, lots of different definitions about empathy. I'm strictly talking about one functional process here. I mean, we, you know, people talk about rather different functional processes when they talk about empathy. I'm defining empathy for the purposes of now as this response to the distress of other individuals and what that response does it makes you freeze in the short term so you stop doing the nasty thing if you have to be the perpetrator or if you're seeing somebody in distress you learn from that distress cue what um, what action they did uh, what action the other person did and you gain negative valence for that action because it's something that's associated with this effectively punishing cue of the other person's distress so healthy um, response to the distress of others involves freezing and it involves learning about stimuli in the environment um, and providing negative value for those stimuli in the environment. 
<laughs> I seem to come back periodically. So this links in with um, the uh, with the the idea with the symptom set that follows from dysfunction in this circuitry being carousel emotional traits. And this is the um, the DSM sort of quasi equivalent of, of carousel emotional traits now, the low prosocial emotion specifier. Okay, so lack of remorse or guilt, okay, lack of empathy. Um, uh, unconcerned about performance and shallow and deficient affect. So this is callous on emotional traits. And the idea is, is basically that this fundamental impairment in responding to the distress of other individuals focused around the amygdala but obviously involving other circuits as well, other systems as well, is uh, when dysfunctional underpinning the development of callous on emotional traits. And this is one of the sort of uh, older studies, oh dear it's not, but it would, should be. There we go, it's back. So, this is one of the oldest studies in this classic morphed expression paradigm. You're looking at what rural regions respond the more um, intense the uh, uh, distress cue is, this fearful expression. Healthy individuals, children with ADHD, show greater amygdala responses the more um, um, uh, fearful the expression is. Individuals who show these callous on emotional traits don't show this uptick in responding as the expression shows um, uh, greater amounts of distress. It's a pretty, in, particularly within the child literature, the combat disorder literature, it's a robust finding that most other groups have been picking up. The, the, the data with adults is somewhat more mixed, but certainly with the kidney data, it's very, very clear um, um, set of data. That, I, it might be because every time I touch it, it seems to fade in and out, but, um, but, uh, but let's just see how long it lasts. So what I'm going to try and do is just basically map out these little schematics so that you see neural areas, um, under, um, uh, risk factors, um, uh, cognitive impairment and the types of behavioural profile, the types of symptom set that fall out from this functional impairment. So the idea, we have these problems in responding to distress cues underpinned by amygdala, uh, reduced amygdala as they're responding, and we see callous on emotional traits. And we see conduct problems because if you don't care about the distress of other individuals, it's much easier to harm other individuals in order to achieve your goals. Most people find it quite distressing to be nasty to other individuals and um, uh, will only do it if there's a really major reward going on. If I told you that taking the, my bottle of water was going to, um, well no, actually, uh, if I told you that, um, yeah, taking my bottle of water was going to earn you $10 million, all of you should be wanting to take my bottle of water. I mean, you'd be idiots if you did, if you really believed me, which you shouldn't, but if you did, you should want to take my, 10 million, uh, my bottle because you're going to gain $10 million, you can buy me a bottle of water tomorrow. If I tro told you you had to stab me to death with this bottle of water, hopefully none of you are rushing towards the bottle of water under those circumstances, <laughs> because it is, uh, although you'll get $10 million, you'll have to deal with me being all distressed, you'll imagine my wife and kidneys being all upset, and you know, so you won't want to do it. It's a massively more aversive cue. The idea is that if you have these sort of level of problems, you're much more like how you were reasoning about stealing the, 10 million, uh, the, the bottle for $10 million when you were thinking about actually harming another individual for gain. So, I'm going to come back to uh, counter-emotional traits of distress piece in a short while, but I'm just going to now focus on the other, the flip side of uh, emotional responding. From a hypo-responding of the amygdala and underpinning an absence of response to distress cues, to a hyper-responding of this acute threat response. So this is a very basic bit of, bit of neural architecture. The amygdala hypothalamus down to periaqueduct to brain. It's our basic threat circuitry. It allows us to freeze when it's a low level of threat, flee when it's a little bit higher level of threat, and fight if the threat's really intense. If we're trapped in the corner, the last thing we do will be attempt a uh, maximum activation of the system to fight our way through the tiger if we're being cornered by the tiger. Um, uh, and this is this huge amount of animal literature on this. Now the idea is that we can't get my There's magic buttons. I find myself doing all that sort of yeah, superstitious behavior, yeah, exactly. I am a pigeon in this moment. So, um, um, uh, this is one of the paradigms we use for um, um, looking at emotional responding. You have uh, emotional stability coming up, you have a task that you might have to do. So, uh, count the number of numbers here. This is an easy trial, congruent trial, 5 5. This is more difficult, incongruent trials. This paradigm will come up at various points, so um, uh, I'm just sort of flagging it up now. 
Well, you see, if you look at youth with um, uh, CD and ODD, disruptive behavior disorders, you see that those individuals with low council emotional traits, with high council emotional traits, show this deficient amygdala response and ventral medial response to emotional stimuli, fitting in with the data I've just shown you before. But within the sample of youth with CD, you see another group of individuals who don't show a deficient amygdala response, but in fact actually show this exaggerated, exaggerated emotional response to um, um, uh, emotional stimuli. And the idea is that if you have an exaggerated response to emotional stimuli, rather than freezing or um, fleeing when a threat stimuli come in, you lash out. And if anybody wants to look at, there's a glorious video called Man Punches Snowman on YouTube. Somebody was doing this prank where they had somebody dressed up as a snowman and the snowman would orientate towards people if they came too close. And so you suddenly have an inanimate stimuli orienting close, looming over you. That's a classic, classic well not so much inanimate, but the looming is a classic threat response. Most people freeze, some people back off. This one particular individual punches the living daylights out of the snowman and squashes this poor unfortunate child on the other side. It's a spectacularly funny slide if you don't think about the small child getting squashed on the other side. But it is very funny, but it's also a brilliant example of reactive aggression because there's clearly no planning involved in this individual. He's lashing out to this threat stimulus. And, um, and uh, so the idea is that if this threat system is overly responsive, then you're going to be at risk for um, um, uh, reactive aggression, lashing out temper tantrums. <laughs> so in other words, we imagine, now this is schematic data here, we imagine what we're seeing in, within the CD group is two very different populations. One of whom has these callous and emotional traits because they have a reduced amygdala response to the distress of other individuals. They don't show emotional responding very successfully to the distress of other individuals. They just don't care about harming other individuals terribly much. But we have this other group of individuals with conduct disorder who show a heightened threat response. And so when they're threatened, when they're socially provoked, when they're frustrated, they're far more likely to lash out at um, the individual who's provoked them, or the circumstances, or in this case, at the, at the, um, at the snowman. So those are these two different, so why should we care about this? Well, clearly there's very clear implications for treatment. You do not want to be treating all kids with conduct disorder in the same way. If you're trying to treat conduct disorder by reducing emotional hypersensitivity, that might be really useful for this group, but it's really gonna do absolutely nothing for this group. And if you had an intervention that was going to be really effective, and people have sort of talked about some of the uh, stimulant medications, might be effective at bringing the individuals with CD and callous emotional traits a little bit online, we really don't want, if that therapy actually does work, if that therapy really does increase the people responding to uh, emotional stimuli, which there are some data suggesting it does, we really don't want to do it to that group that's highly hyper emotional responsive because they're just going to be at much greater risk of um, having problematic behavior in the future. In fact, if you look through the literature on um, stimulant and medication use, it's, the literature is all over the place, potentially reflecting the sample sets that have gone into those treatment studies. Now, and we're gonna start seeing some of the voice sound later here. Now, the problem is, is that things get complicated once you start looking at maltreatment. And um, um, uh, there's been this literature out there suggesting there's a few people out there, Eva Kimonis in particular has been saying for some time, at least a few years, last five years or so, that there is a group of individuals out there who've experienced high levels of maltreatment who show callous on emotional traits. And I have to say, when she kept to, she's been saying this for ages, I've always thought she was just totally wrong. Because the problem with that viewpoint is that if you have maltreatment, the, a huge amount of literature says that maltreatment leads to an individual where there's exaggerated emotional responding to threat. I mean, there's just massive amounts of literature out there to make you believe that's the case. But if that is the case, then maltreatment cannot give rise to callous and emotional traits because callous and emotional traits are associated with reduced amygdala response to distress. So, you know, whenever she used to present this data, I used to say, no, that's just, just, just talking nonsense. But I wouldn't say that because I'm too nice to say that. But I would think it. I would be thinking this test cannot be right. It makes no biological sense whatsoever. But we did thought we'd better have a look at it just in case because she has been doing it for a while. And, you know, maybe she's right after all. And 
much to my boot here, much to my surprise, and you're surprised that I got it as well. We actually find um, something really very odd indeed. So, this is the classic finding here. The more uh, the, the more callous emotional traits you show, the less of an amygdala response you show to distress key stimulus. It's a finding that we've had many times before, other people have found before, very robustly found before. Now, the trouble is, and I was explaining some of the joy, well, some of the other advantages of leaving NIH are that you, you, have, you have limited areas. You can't go into substance abuse work because that's MIAAA or NIDA. And so, as an NIMH person, you definitely can't do that because that will be taking government funds from one place to another place. That's a really bad sin. And the other thing is that you can't do work on um, uh, maltreatment terribly easily because of the issues about liability and you don't have the clinical resources to do anything about anything you discover. So we were clearly oversampling previously, and most places do oversample, on places where there was no clear indications of significant maltreatment. The Boys Town sample, we're looking at individuals who are around about 50% of the population there, have suffered some degree of significant maltreatment, whether it's emotional abuse, physical, sexual, or neglect. And when we looked at that group separately, we find a, you know, this very striking interaction between CU traits, amygdala response, and um, um, experience of prior maltreatment. If you've had high levels of mal prior maltreatment, the um, amygdala CU trait story no longer applies. Eva Camonis was not talking nonsense. It, it turns out to be at least, you know, we're seeing it in our data as well. You only ever really believe stuff when you see it in your own data, or at least I don't believe stuff when you see it in my own data. So, um, and I just, you know, it's, it's, we're seeing this indication. So, if we're going to go back to that schematic, if I can ever get a schematic card for you. We do see the amygdala response, decreased empathy, chaos and emotional traits, that's there. But in addition, maltreatment is giving rise to this type of amygdala responding. Um, uh, we're assuming hypothalamus and PAG, although it's not been well documented at all. Quite what on earth at the cognitive level is really going on is just not clear. I mean, our style of attribution bias might be something. But we're seeing this sort of presentation of chaos and emotional traits. It looks behaviorally like callous and emotional traits, but it's, uh, it's callous and emotional traits that's got a very different neural underpinning from what we've previously been documenting. And again, it just reinforces, at least for me, this idea that really relying on what people are saying, relying on what people are behaving, is just not good enough. We need to understand what's going on at the underlying biological level if we're going to have effective treatment. This strongly suggests, I mean, again, it could be that assuming it, re it replicates a strong result, it strongly re suggests that we do need to very clearly understand the, whether the individual has suffered maltreatment, and we need to understand what the implications of the brain level is. Have, are they the individual who's shown the hyper response and a, a very emotionally labile, or are they the individual who's shown this hypo response and being very distressed to unresponsive, much more increased risk for uh, burning down, so, uh, so um, um, uh, distress cues. Um, and uh, yeah, so. so that's basically what I'm going to tell you about emotional responding, but I'm going to move on to a somewhat different circuitry, and then we'll flip back to all of this stuff at the end. Um, response control, so that's the sort of behavioral inhibition is the other phrase that's used. Very nice, you know, with most of this stuff, we've got lots and lots of basic findings. We have expression processing stuff, we've got a whole slew of healthy individual studies to rely on to get um, um, a picture of what the healthy brain looks like. The same with response control. There's been a, a good array of studies looking at the important role of inferior frontal cortex, um, anterior uh, insula, and you know, dorsal medial regions um, involved in response control, behavioral inhibition. I prefer the term response control rather than behavioral inhibition, so that's the one I'm going to be using. Now, going back to that data set that I was showing you before with this exact same paradigm, we're now not focusing on the response to the emotional stimuli, but we're just focusing on the response when doing task performance. Same subjects as we saw before. We felt, so showed you before that within the conduct disorder group, those with high levels of callous and emotional response uh, 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 traits showed reduced emotional responding. Those with low levels showed increased emotional response in relative to healthy individuals. We can't make that distinction now for high and low callous and emotional traits with respect, to res with respect to response control problems. But a significant number of the kids within the sample, within the group of DBD, 
were showing significant impairment, both on the task, but particularly in the recruitment of anterior insula during um, those incongruent trials, in response control trials, particularly incongruent trials, we'll say instead of in response control trials. And what's importantly is that the more that within that sample, just to the DVD kids, the more that they showed impairment in recruitment of regions for response control, the greater levels of ADHD impulsivity symptoms they were showing. So in other words, we had the same group of kids. Some of those, and that's that group, were showing a heightened emotional response, low callus on emotional traits, I'm assuming irritability, reactive aggression. Some of the other ones within that group were showing very low levels of amygdala response, callus on emotional traits, problems with prosocial. Irrespective of their callus on emotional traits, some of the group, the, the patients within that group, were showing profound problems in response control, architecture recruitment, and therefore ADHD impulsivity, and some of the individuals weren't. So we're getting two effective continuums within that group that have CD. And so again, what I'm you know, vigorously pushing towards is going towards a system where we get an individual, at least assuming we can do it, individualized assessment of the underlying psychopathology the individual is facing so that we understand the symptom sets they're seeing and so we can see whether, if we're doing an intervention, whether that system comes down or whether the other system comes by or they both come down. So, you know, again, we see these very different, um, uh, we can see it, it, at a group level, the CD cases looked like they had problems in emotion and problems in um, uh, response control, but at an individual level, that's not the case, and the types of problems relate to very different symptom sets. Now, one of the things that we're looking at here is this issue about our, our precursors. Because we can work with this population of boys have a relatively large sample, we can look at um, uh, what the impact of substance abuse is, what's the impact of cannabis use, and what's the impact, impact of alcohol usage on these brain circuits. So using the exact same task as effective stroop task, what do we see um, with the relationship with audit scores, the, uh, the alcohol use um, disorder, inventory, whatever it stands the last bit for. But basically, severity of alcohol, um, alcohol use problems um, relating to level of brain pathology. And what we see is problems here in dorsal medial, problems in this sort of superior frontal, and this massive problem with posterior cingulate precuneus that's quite robustly seen in studies of alcohol use disorder. The reason why I'm just going to flash this up if you remember right at the beginning, I was talking about how do we understand psychopathology? Is psychopathology a failure to show what a healthy individual does? Or is psychopathology doing something dramatically different from what a healthy individual does? Or is it some combination of those two? And so when we look at this, so this over here is, a, is actually an SVM um, um, result just with healthy individuals. So looking at the um, task performance, we see the recruitment of regions critical for task performance. If we look at then on the right, this is the impact of alcohol use problems. What we're suddenly seeing is that within this major dorsal medial component of a healthy response to task performance, a significant failure to recruit that region. So in other words, at least part of the problem that we're seeing in, um, as a consequence of alcohol use disorder is a failure to, um, or it's a disruption of the health and the systems that the healthy individual is using to perform the task. But in addition, we're picking up, this is not a region that pops up in the healthy individual's task performance, and yet we're seeing profoundly compromised recruitment of this region in the individuals with substance with, it, with alcohol use disorder, as a function of level of alcohol use disorder, um, uh, um, um, that's just not part of the you know it's just not part of the healthy response during this task. Yet it's something that's very failed to be recruited in these individuals. So in other words, it looks for, at least from these data that we should understand alcohol use disorder again, assuming they replicate all the rest of it, as a degree of disruption of the healthy system. But then something on top that's being picked up, something very different that's being picked up from um, a healthy individual. Now we see this region, or the failure of this region recruited in a whole bunch of different tasks. I'm not going to show you any other data for today because the data are just really coming in the last couple of days. But this, this problem here seems to be a very, um, you know, across tasks we're seeing problems in this region. And in fact, I'm speaking with other people who are doing much more, uh, uh, have found a lot of this posterior senior precuneus impairment as a fun function of substance abuse. 
One other thing to note here is that we see this problem massively more pronounced with respect to alcohol use pro uh, disorder than cannabis use disorder. So the view that really all drugs are either um, have a comparable impact on the brain, at least within our data, at least with respect to these two, doesn't seem to hold, um, hold up. And in fact, looking across the literature, you see it, it's surprisingly not massively pushed forward as a view. Probably because the people who are pushing the view that they're all the same are those that control the money. So you know, they've never said the idea that they are, that are different at all. But, but the fact is, is that um, I, I, I don't see that data with our data, and talk with others, not seeing that either. Oops. Now, no, well, now, let's see. Ah, there you go. So, um, if we look at maltreatment, we see some of it, some degree of overlap and posterior singular, a ventromedial issue that we don't see in the healthy individuals, and we don't see in the, uh, in the um, um, uh, as a function of substance abuse either. The data, is, uh, this is an early set of the data, I'm only really using it just to illustrate the issue. One of the really critical things is what we've got is large enough data sets that we can actually not just look at maltreatment relative to non-maltreatment, or we can examine specific forms of maltreatment. Emotional abuse relative to physical abuse, sexual abuse relative to the others, neglect relative to abuse. And you see that these levels of problems are massively more the case for abuse relative to neglect. We see problems related to neglect, but they're much more, uh, you know, not in regions that we would consider core for psychopathology that we're picking up at the moment. And on top of that, it really seems to be an emotional abuse and sexual abuse phenomenon. We see very high, if you, if you do conjunction analyses across the various different contrasts, you see very similar results for emotional abuse as well as sexual abuse, as well as the abuse global score. Physical abuse has an impact, but it has a somewhat differential impact. And what's notable as well is we see that the extent to which um, sexual or emotional abuse has compromised the functioning of many of these systems mediates the um, relationship between the prior abuse level that the child that the individual has suffered and their current levels of depression and also to a certain extent the current levels of irritability and reactive aggression. So in other words, we can start mapping out prior conditions to brain areas to psychiatric sequelae. And of course, the real focus for me, again, is to see the extent to which the Boys Town intervention, the extent to which interventions targeted, there's two interventions we're looking at, there's EMDR and eye movement direction therapy and a CBT that's specifically focused on trauma, that we're looking at the extent to which either of those normalize some of these signals, whether they bring the person back to the healthy level or whether, and whether they uh, remove some of these atypical findings. So, just again, again, these frameworks I very, I don't actually click, I, I, you know, normally I would like to say I push out models. This stuff is too schematic to really call it a model, so I'm calling it a framework just so that, uh, you know, uh, and especially since I know some of it from some of the more recent days, some bits of it a little bit uh, uh, are not going to last the test of time. So it's very much a framework just to give you a flavor of where we are. But what we're seeing is substance abuse and maltreatment are having comparable effects, certainly within PCC, superior frontal, I didn't really show you, but they definitely have a very similar result in some bits of motor cortex. Substance abuse is much more dorsal media. We don't see that with the maltreatment data that we've been getting so far. We're assuming that many of these things, I'm just going to ignore the ventral media or the DCC, but many of these things are associated with the reduced response control. And again, we're seeing that this is a risk factor for substance abuse and impulsivity more generally. I showed you with that earlier set of data with the CD, this doesn't particularly relate to antisocial behavior generally. It probably exacerbates, but it exacerbates primarily because it just increases impulsivity more generally. One thing that's notable is that there's no doubt about it, this, um, uh, um, that there's been data out there suggesting that if you have problems of impulse control, you're significantly more likely to develop substance use problems. So you can imagine that what we may actually end up with is this rather unfortunate um, uh, uh, vicious circle that you engage in drugs, it damages systems for response control, you um, then are at increased risk of showing uh, drug use in the future that damages it further and it keeps on going. So again, the extent to which we'll see normalization of this from um, uh, following treatment in substance abuse programs is one of the other projects we're engaged in, but I don't have data for that at all. So, we're now going to um, uh, talk about systems involved in the different aspects of... So I started a little bit after half past and was hoping to go a little bit after half past, so 
So, but there is an end to this. Do not panic. I will, uh, I will, uh, I will shut up eventually. So. The other great thing about reinforcement um, uh, decision making is there's such a lot of literature on it from the, the cognitive neuroscience field. I mean, you know, a lot of your work in this uh, area has been very important as well. So, you know, we have a really, really nice set of data to draw from to understand the findings that we see, both human as well as animal work as well. And this is just a review that uh, Randall and our colleagues did, just talking about regions that were particularly important for representing subject, 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 look, subjective value in decision making paradigms. And this is some data from Knudsen's group on systems when you're avoiding as a function of the value of the choice that you're making. You see um, the recruitment of these classic sort of dorsal medial anterior and so inferior frontal regions as you avoid bad choices as a function of how bad the choice was from a value point of view. So we can map out, or at least we can theoretically map out, um, a uh, framework. Neural structure and speed are very important for choice and expected value calculations, right? They're very important for feedback prediction error signaling. Dorsal medial and anterior insula are very important for avoidance and using um, avoidance, using expected value information to generate avoidance responses. Again, framework, clearly massively overly simplified, but just indeed um, to get the framework so we can begin to start unpack unpacking these things. So, we're going to cluster our venture media for the next couple of uh, slides. And um, uh, so, one of the reasons why I think venture media is particularly important with respect to um, uh, antisocial behavior is because ventral medial um, frontal cortex is massively interconnected with the amygdala and this um, uh, um, uh, threat response circuit. Now I know there's a big literature out there on the sort of idea that the ventral medial is the brakes for the amygdala, that's the sort of clinical neuroscience view of the amygdala is the brakes for the amygdala, uh, ventral medial is the brakes for the amygdala. I'm not a big fan of that view. I mean, there clearly are inhibitory connections between ventral medial and um, amygdala, so it's not a completely wrong view. But at the same time, for me, the two real clear data points that make me deeply concerned about that is that, you know, there's the showdown data that shows if you lesion the amygdala or you lesion ventral medial, it's not that if you lesion ventral medial, the amygdala becomes massively over-responsive, it's the amygdala becomes less responsive, it deactivates, it, it can't, you know, because it's, its typical role is highly interactive with ventral medial. If one part of the circuit is dysfunctional, particularly lesion dysfunctional, the rest of the circuit doesn't work terribly well. At least that's the show bound data. In addition, John Grafman's created, although there's been some uh, question about some of that data, John Grafman's produced very interesting data showing that if you have lesions of ventral medial prefrontal cortex, it protects you from the development of mood and anxiety disorders rather than increases the risk that you'll develop the mood and anxiety disorders, which is what you have to predict if this was the brake system. So I don't think that it's the brake system, I think it's a massively interactive role. And one of the things that's going on is that it's by um, representing the value of response choices out there, it means that you select what you're going to do based around um, what um, ventral medial frontal cortex is signaling. Will you freeze? Will you fight? Or will you do something else entirely? So that's the basic idea. And looking at this, oops, we've you've been using, there are things like the Taylor regression paradigm, the point star distraction paradigm. We wanted a fluffier version of those tasks that were a bit less nasty and easier to control from an energy perspective. And so we use this version of um, a sort of ultimatum game but it's an ultimatum game where you can fight back. You don't just have to reject the offer if you don't like it. You can actually harm the other individual. Each trial, the other individual has $20 and can share with you, or will share with you, either be nice and giving you 10 and taking 10 to themselves, up to really being nasty, taking 18 and only giving you two. But each trial, you have $3 to spend. That's what's given to you at the beginning of that trial. And you get to choose what you want to do with that. Any dollar you spend, you take away seven dollars from your opponent. So what you can do, in other words, is you can spend all of your money, take away absolutely everything they have, and then a little bit more so. So you can retaliate extremely if you feel like it. And you can, you can get a retaliation score as well as um, um, a response to unfair offers. And I'm just going to whiz through that. So what you see Again, this is back to these two groups, the DVD with uh, high levels of callous and emotional traits and without callous and emotional traits. 
what you see is this profound problems with ventral media. So the healthy individuals, sorry, I should have said, healthy individuals, the more that they punish, the less ventral medial prefrontal cortex activity they show. And the idea is that if you're a healthy individual, that um, uh, at least my view of what's going on here, is that if you're a healthy individual, you're coding that retaliation really isn't that cunning a plan. If I spend all my money, I not only don't get the money they were going to give me, but I don't get anything at all. I've maximally lost what I got. The more I retaliate, the less I have. So from a subjective value point of view, the more that I retaliate, the lousier my decision is. Now, I've got lots of other reasons for which we're driving my behavior, but uh, from a straight value of the response, the more retaliation is the worst you can do. So that's why I'm assuming the more retaliation you see, the less activity that the healthy individuals show. The individuals with low callous and emotional traits, what we're assuming this irritable group do, they um, uh, really fail. I mean, uh, most of the DVD fail to a certain extent, but they really fail to show that deactivation as a function of um, uh, increased, um, uh, um, um, increased uh, punishment. And what you also see is the connectivity. When you're um, in high complex provocation um, circumstances, the connection, connectivity between the amygdala and ventromedial, positive in the healthy individuals, just it's very deficient in the individuals with DVD. And what was quite nice, we saw that the um, retaliatory behavior on our task did correlate with reactive aggression through parental and self-reports, and that relationship was mediated through the, um, both uh, within the sample of individuals with DVD, mediated by um, uh, both failure to suppress that ventral medial signal and by reduced connectivity between the amygdala and ventral medial prefrontal cortex. So the idea from a schematic point of view is that ventral medial prefrontal cortex is critical for expected value representation and the more that that's that proper, the, the, the poorer you are in representing the value of your choices, the more likely you are to engage in reactive aggression because you're not going to be representing the fact that, you know, lashing out is not a cunning plan to do in many circumstances. You will have serious costs in the future. Talking a little bit about anterior insula now. And this is some of the first data from this other paradigm, the passive avoidance paradigm. Very easy paradigm. All you have to do is say, well, or just respond with a button when, when you see a stimulus is present. If it's a good stimulus, if you respond when the stimulus is present, you'll get reward. Uh, or more often than not, you'll get reward. If it's a bad stimulus present, more often than not, you'll get punishment. There's only two good stimuli and two bad stimuli. It's a very probabilistic design. So over time, if you always responded on this stimulus, you would win sometimes and you'd lose some other times. But if this is one of the good ones, you'd more often win than, not, than, than, than lose. If it's one of the bad stimuli, you more often lose than win. So in other words, you're looking at the extent to which the person can learn to go to the good stimuli and avoid the bad stimuli. And you can do prediction error and expected value calculations, which I'm not going to go into, but uh, you, you can model it with that. And what you see is a very classic finding, and many people have pointed to Joe Newman's paradigm from way back when. What you see is if you have psychopathic traits, if you have common disorder, you're significantly poorer at learning to avoid the bad stimulus. It's a classic, very classic finding that Joe um, uh, uh, reported some, some long time ago, right? 19, yeah, very long time ago, first finding. This sample again, we see youth with DVD, comparison of individuals, match for age. I should have said that all of these samples are uh, uh, match for age, IQ, and gender. Um, uh, what you see is a very notable failure in the individuals with DVD, totally unrelated to callous and emotional traits level, but very clearly related to um, uh, having DVD. Failure to recruit this region as a function of expected value when you're avoiding bad choices. So when you, you're not showing the modulation of activity within this region as a function of how bad the decision is. Healthy individuals, nice upregulation, the more bad the decision is from an expected value point of view, the youth with DVD just are not showing that. And this is from a voice talent sample with a rather larger and a bigger spread of um, pathology. Again, you see the, the task performance and relationship with combat problems is mediated by this failure to recruit these regions of anterior, um, anterior insula. So a failure to code the flashiness of the, uh, of, the um, um, of the action 
and therefore avoid the payment. It's relating directly. It doesn't relate to carousel emotional traits. No predictive value for the level of the person's carousel emotional traits, but it does have predictive value for the level of conduct problems they show. And again, the idea would be that you know one of the things that gets you off doing dumb choices is representing how dumb those choices are. And that if you're not representing how dumb those, you're not being pushed away from it. You're more likely, all other things being, being equal, to engage in those things. And so it won't just be conduct problems, but it'd be other unfortunate choices. Strider involvement in prediction error is the last of these ones. Again, same paradigm we're using, same sets of data. What you see in healthy individuals, very nice signal that the more unexpectedly good the reward was, the more unexpected the reward um, was, as a classic find in the literature, the greater the striatal response. You don't see that in um, the individual with DVD. You see that it's significantly reduced um, uh, uh, the striatal response to reward. So that's the third of these. So basically, the individual with DVD, we see these very pronounced, very profound, very generalized problems in reinforcement based decision making using expected value information with an intermediate to guide behavior, using expected value information with an anterior insert to guide avoidance responses, and failure again with prediction error signaling in uh, stride, at least in some of the studies. So, moving on to you know, what, to what extent do we see issues with substance abuse? What extent do we see issues with maltreatment on this architecture? I have to change to a different paradigm here because we haven't looked at the data with respect to the passive avoidance task. But this is the very classic monetary incentive delay task. Um, so you see a queue, if you respond in time when the target's there, you will get the reward depending on and how much reward will be told by the queue level. Punishment trials, if you respond in time, you'll avoid the loss of money. All I want to really show here is that the extent to which you've shown alcohol severity, uh, the extent to which you show alcohol severity problems relates directly to the failure to um, uh, recruit striatum as a function of reward received. This is not a new finding, it's, a lot of other people have seen it as well, but we're seeing it within this sample too, and it's clearly an indication again that the alcohol use problems profoundly compromises that striatal reward signaling um, uh, response. So alcohol is one route in to at least part of these um, systems going down. Collaborating with a group from the Institute of Psychiatry, yes, the group um, is a very well characterized youth, uh, sample of youth with maltreatment, comparison individuals, uh, and we see very profound problems within that sample. Uh, this was again, this is back to the passive avoidance paradigm, very profound problems in prediction error signaling within both ventromedial and within striatum. So it looks like both substance abuse, or at least alcohol abuse, and maltreatment, and this was a severely maltreated group, although pretty heterogeneous, heterogeneous in the, the form of maltreatment, both of these compromise at least the um, systems engaged in uh, uh, prediction error signaling. So back to the framework, what we see is substance abuse and trauma hitting the uh, impact of the striatal responsiveness. Trauma, at least so far, um, being the only one to disrupt a ventromedial signaling. And seeing the consequences of that functionally, and then the behavioral profile following from that. So, conclusions just on the reinforcement decision making. The extent to which ventromedial fails to represent the value of choices relates to the level of reactive aggression. If you're not representing um, uh, the, uh, the uh, value of your responses, you're more likely to engage in an action, or more likely to push forward an action um, that um, uh, might look good because you're retaliating, you're really irritated with the person, but in fact actually isn't in your long-term best interests. The individual fails to represent the potential reward loss or retaliation. Then the extent to which AIC fails to represent the value of avoidance responses um, uh, relates to levels of conduct problems generally. We don't see any selective relationship with um, reactive aggression. It's really a very generalized problem. I have to say, we don't find any specific relationship with symptom set severity of prediction error signaling. Now, we are, haven't looked so far with respect to ADHD and impulsiveness with respect to ADHD, but there is a literature out there shows, uh, strongly claiming that the failure to engage in reward prediction error signaling is related to impulsivity. There's a meta-analytic review um, documenting that failure. So it's quite possible that this set of problems is far more having a general effect on impulsiveness uh, generally, at least according to that, um, um, that literature. So, frameworks we have 
Amygdala hypo-responsive, decreased empathy, parasitic emotional traits. We also can see hyper from certain types of um, uh, trauma. We haven't really looked at um, the impact of um, uh, substance abuse yet for this uh, terribly effectively. But, um, but then we're seeing uh, much more risk for a reactive aggression. And indeed, under certain circumstances, we see something that looks behaviorally like chaos and emotional traits, even though it's underpinned by a completely different psychopathology. Response control, we see these very clear issues of both substance abuse and maltreatment on many of the systems involved and potentially exacerbating up the individual's genetic risk um, uh, and increasing the risk for impulsivity generally and potentially increasing the risk for substance abuse which may then further compound the level of problems. And I just showed you the reinforced one, and I will do this very rapidly because this is the very last slide, and it means that at least I've shown you the very last slide before the actual machine fails for me the last time. <laughs> and I hasten to say, this is very preliminary, we've only got 17 subjects in this particular analysis, so do not take these data particularly seriously, but um, we are up to having 50, I just haven't analysed the rest of the day, we haven't analysed the rest of the data, and we're collecting more ongoing, so that's one of the reasons why we haven't, but we want to have a first look uh, a month or two back. We're just looking at two paradigms here. This is data from that passive avoidance paradigm, that emotion, that, that, that decision-making paradigm. So we're looking at individuals that came in to the Boys Town program, and then 12 months later are leaving the Boys Town program. And do we see a change in neural signature? And I have to say, and I, A, I wasn't expecting reinforcement-based decision-making to be affected by the Boys Town Psychosocial Program. And maybe this is all going to go away. But the fact is, what we see within that 17 individuals is that the striatal response to prediction error was increasing, reward prediction error, was increasing through the 12 month period. Now, again, we don't have, there's all sorts of caveats, and so I'm just, that's why preliminary is absolutely in capital letters. But the fact is, we're seeing some degree of normalization of that, that problem within the sample. In addition, on a paradigm I haven't talked about before uh, at all, is a looming paradigm where threats come towards you and all the rest of it. We're seeing recruitment of ventral medial prefrontal cortex, which we never saw before. We don't typically see ventral medial prefrontal cortex in this task, but that now, following 12 months in the program, we're beginning to see um, recruitment of this region um, uh, in possibly some form of compensatory way, although again, for every data, only 17 people, it's really just flashing up as a suggestion of what we might see in the future. And hopefully that was roughly 60 minutes, and you're not absolutely desperately wanting to get away. And, um, and uh, that was the end of the talk, so I hope that was of interest. So thank you very much for listening.